In the last two videos, we looked at the start of a board bring up for the Silink Zinc based development board, which I developed called the ZBread. Initially, we just looked at how we can configure the Zinc via JTAG using Vivato and Vitis, how we can configure the FTDI and so forth and do a basic board bring up. In the second video, we then look at configuring the DDR3 memory interface, testing that we can access the whole one gigabyte of DDR3L memory that's available on this board. We verified that successfully, and now we're ready to move on to the various remaining peripherals on this board. In particular, we're gonna look at the QSPI non-volatile flash memory that's available on this board, which we can then use to upload code to this part, and then in turn, this part can then be used to configure the Zinc. In this way, we don't always have to have this JTAG connection and we can boot directly from the QSPI memory. And I'd like to show you how to do that very simply in this video. Before you continue, make sure to check out the first two videos. One is number 96, which talks about the initial board bring up, testing the JTAG connection and doing a very basic UART hello world. The previous video, video number two, is, is video number 97, and that looks at the whole DDR3 bring up, as well as all the memory tests we performed on this board. With that being performed successfully, let's move on to the QSBI bring up. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I designed this setbread PCB completely using Altium Designer with many high-speed interfaces, and I'll make a hardware walkthrough in a future video of this board. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash phil's lab and you can get yourself an altium designer free trial and check out all the cool new altium 365 features in altium designer let's briefly go through the hardware connections and you'll see for the qspi interface which is just a quad serial peripheral interface the connection is very straightforward if we go to the schematic page of the zinc processing system we can see in bank zero, which is running off 3.3 volts, I have these QSBI signals. So it's the chip select, it's the four bit wide data signals, which are bi-directional, as well as the clock. These pins I got from Vivado as usual, and we'll see that in just a second in the Vivado configuration, that these are the only possible pins for this QSBI interface for this particular zinc. The memory I hooked up to this is simply just a point-to-point -point connection. I've got a pull-up resistor on the chip select line, as well as just a series termination resistor for the clock line, in case I get any ringing or EMI problems. This particular memory part you have to pay attention to, the one you actually end up using on your zinc-based design, or if you're designing for a different IC, for example, Arctic 7 or Spartan 7, you need to choose specific QSBI or flash memory ICs that are actually compatible with your chosen device. And you can see that in the note I made here, we need to look at the Silinx User Guide 908 and check out the supported flash memory section. With the Vivado User Guide 908 open, it happens to be on page 328 is the configuration memory support. And this depends on the Silinx or AMD device you're using, so Arctic 7, Kintex, but we're of course interested on page 361 and the Zinc 7000 series configuration memory devices. And these are all of the memory devices that are natively supported by the programming tools and make sure we can easily program the QSBI using Xilinx's tools. Of course, there are different flash memory interfaces such as QSBI, NOR and NAND, but QSBI is a very simple interface, so that's what I went with. Then scrolling down to table C9, we can see the supported flash memory devices for the Zing 7000. So depending on which part you would like to use, on the cost, on what kind of density or size you can get for these parts, you will choose one of these. One device that was very popular and available everywhere is from Winbond. Your interface is QSBI and anything that starts with W25Q128 we can use according to this guide. So that's exactly what I chose. I chose this W25Q128. This is 128 megabit memory, so 16 megabyte, and this is sufficient for most applications. Looking at the actual PCB design, the pins are quite nicely the perimeter of this BGA package, so I'll have all my QSBI interfaces here, and they're essentially just routed straight to my QSBI memory IC at the top over here. What we should also take note of, because we'll need this later on, is that actually these QSBI pins are also boot mode select pins. So QSBI DQ3 happens to be the M0 boot mode pin, DQ1 is M1 and so on. And these various strapping options are detailed in one of the application notes by Xilinx. I've just extracted this table from that application note. Depending if we pull these boot mode or mode pins high or low, we can get different boot behaviors or different PLL, bank voltages and so on. What will be important for us later is that the boot setting currently is 000 for boot mode 0, 1 and 2. But if you want to boot from the QSPI memory, we can see this row that we actually have to pull boot mode zero high. And we'll come back to this later on, but it's important to know that the QSPI lines also double as the boot mode's pins as well, which need to be pulled high or low or toggleable depending on the situation. What we need to make now 
is what's called a first stage bootloader or FSBL for short. This bootloader, which is then programmed onto our board, lets us take application code, for example, a different application, for example, a Hello World UR, or a more advanced application, of course. The first aid bootloader will take that and then load that from the program memory into the Zinc device itself. So this is something you always have to do if you want to boot, for example, from QSPI memory. Therefore, we need two steps. We first have to create this first aid bootloader. Then we also have to create the application we actually want this bootloader to load into our Zinc device. I'll leave some links in the description which give more detail on the first aid bootloader and I'll just show you very simply how to create one yourself. Again, let's start with Vivado. We have our block design, which I'll open. And this is the same design we had from the last DDR memory video. So all the DDR has been set up. If I double click on this, we can see we have one UART set up and that's about it. What I'd like to enable in the peripheral I open section is the QSPI interface and we can see there's only one possibility of these pins in bank zero. So I'll just select that. If I open this drop down, we can see it's a single slave select four bit wide interface. And that's why, as I said before, these pins are pretty much fixed for this device. Then jumping to the clock configuration, if we go to IO peripheral clocks and then look at the QSPI, that's currently at 200 megahertz. And I'll just turn that down to 133 megahertz to be in line with the part that I'm using and then click OK. Then as usual, we need to create a wrapper for this, run the synthesis, run the implementation, generate the bitstream and export the hardware as we've seen in the last two videos. So let me just do that. Now that I've generated the bitstream, as usual, we go to file, export, export hardware, and then we create the XSA file, which we can then use in Vitus. I've selected to include the bitstream and I'll just give this a sensible name and we can click finish. Now with our hardware generated, as before, we go to tools and launch the Vitus IDE because this is what we need to do to start creating our first stage bootloader, our FSBL. Now that we're in Vitus, what we need to do is first of all create this FSBL, this first stage bootloader. And luckily for us, that's quite simple in this case. To do that, we go to the top file, new application project. We need to choose the hardware XSA file we just generated, which in my case happens to be this file, open, Give it a sensible name, for example, your project underscore FSBL. Leave the rest as default until you come to the template section where we have to select the bottom option, Zinc FSBL, and then click finish. Once the project has been created, all we have to do is click the build icon. Next, we need to create the boot image. So what we have to do is go to the Silinks, create boot image, Zinc. We want to import from an existing BIF file and leave everything else as default. And then at the bottom, just click create image. Once boot image has been generated successfully, that's all we need to create for this first stage bootloader. What we now need to do is create the actual application we want to run on the Zinc, which will be pulled or programmed via the first stage bootloader. In essence, you'll always need two different segments. One is the FSBL and one is the actual application you want to run. In our case, we'll just keep it simple. We'll just create another Hello World application and have the FSBL load that onto the Zinc. So go to File, New, Application Project, and this is from the first video, all we have to want to do is create the Hello World template. I'll choose exactly the same XSA file as we just did for the FSBL. Give it a sensible name. Keep everything else default, but select the Hello World template as we did in the first video and click finish and wait for this to generate. Then in Hello World.c, I've modified the code slightly. Otherwise, the code would simply just print Hello World and then print this line and then be done. I want to indefinitely print Hello World or some text. So I've included sleep.h. I've added this while loop and just this microsecond sleep function. Every half a second, it'll print Hello World or whatever text we choose. And I'll just print set bread to QSPI test, for example. Then top left again, we click build. Now, rather than just running or debugging via JTAG, of course, you want to create an image that we can then load onto the QSPI memory. The way we do that is go to our project on the left hand side in Explorer, just right click, create boot image. And again, just keeping all of this as default and clicking create image. And I have the ZBrett plugged in just with a DC barrel jack, as well as the micro USB connection, which is connected to the FTDI, USB to UART and USB to JTAG, which allows us to program the board. I also have a done LED on this board, which isn't illuminated because just as, as it is on startup, we won't be programming the Zinc as it is right now. Right now, the Zinc is just waiting for a JTAG programming, so to speak. On the bottom side of the board, on the top right, you can see these modes select these dip pins and they're all set to zero. So as we saw earlier, this puts it into JTAG mode. So we'll keep it in JTAG mode for now for programming and later we'll flip boot mode switch zero to high, which will put it into QSPI mode. 
With the hardware connected, as I just showed you, what we want to do is program the flash memory. Rather than programming the device directly via JTAG, we of course want to load these images with the first stage bootloader onto the QSBI flash. The way we do that is go to the top bar on Silinks and then Program Flash. We have several options here. First of all, let's look at the flash type, and this depends on your system. I'm using QSBI with four lanes of those used and a single device, so it's QSBI X4 single. The project is whatever application you want, not the first stage bootloader, so I'll choose the Hello World, and the rest you can leave default other than the image and the init file. The image file is the boot.bin file we generated for our Hello World system for, or for the actual application. And this is typically stored in the workspace or wherever you exported that to under the project name, IDE boot image and then boot.bin. And we can just use the browse button to look for that. However, we also have the init file, which is the actual elf file, not the .bin file for the first stage bootloader. And that's typically generated in the debug folder under the workspace and under the project with the FSBL. In my case, it's this address. We can select other options, for example, verify after flash, but we can just leave it at this for now. Important is that the image file is your application and the init file is the ELF file for the FSBL. Then with the board connected via JTAG, click program. And this might take a small while, not too long, less than a minute typically, depending on the size of the application, of course. As you can see now, we've retrieved the flash info, which means it's detected it correctly. It'll start to raise and then write to the flash. Now it's starting to program the flash, which is of course a great sign. We saw that it was detected, it detected the right type of flash, and now it'll program it with FSBL as well as our application. And at the end, you should hopefully see flash operation successful. We have now just completed the flash programming operation, but still the done LED is off. And this is to be expected, as if we look at the jumper settings on the bottom side, we can see the boot mode zero switch is still on low, and this means we have JTAG boot. Now if we flip that to high and then power cycle the board, we'll boot from flash. Now I've flipped the boot mode zero to high to put it in QSBI flash mode. The board is now off, and now I'll power the board on again. The done LED now came on, and that's because we're programming it from the QSBI flash automatically based on our boot mode settings. Now, COM25 is my USB to UART connection, and that should now hopefully show us separate QSBI test. Now we've successfully verified that we can at least talk to the QSBI flash memory. We can generate an FSBL or first stage bootloader together with an application that will then enable us to use the QSBI memory to program the Zinc without needing a direct JTAG connection. And it'll do this on startup, which is really cool. So, so far on this board bring up series, we've verified the JTAG, DDR3 memory connections, QSPI. Next on the list and for the next video, we'll be looking at the Gigabit Ethernet, how we can test that with this Realtek physical layer or PHY and test the bandwidth of this interface. Once we've done that, what's left to check is the eMMC memory as well as the USB high-speed connection. And then we've completed the board bring up for the most part. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it showed you how you can bring up your own custom PCBs if you're incorporating Silent Zinc system on chips. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss any future videos. If you like the video, please do leave a like and a comment if you have any questions. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.